toxin radical based uh, advanced oxidation treat, uh, processes on even some places we discussed on uh, biological treatments like uh, microbial fuel cells and uh, bioelectrophenol so today professor nadais from uh, university of alvaro portugal she will discuss on usb reactor and uh, along with professor nadais we have uh, five experts dr george k vargas from nit calicut dr ashish yadav from uh, uh, csir immt bhuvneshwar dr arvind kumar mugre from svnit surat dr parta kundu from csir nist trivandrum and uh, dr uh, uh, pradab reddy hari prasad reddy from nit warangal is also joining with us so before joining uh, before starting the program i will just introduce dr nadais to you all maria helena gomes de almedia goncalves nadais this is the entire lengthy name i used to call nadais sometimes i used to call maria nadais we have a communication from long i think one 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 and a half years back so this is the first time i am seeing the lengthy name Professor Nadez born in one day Cabra Portugal and did MSc and BSc in 19 uh, in chemical engineering from University Instituto Superior Tecnico in Lisbon University and did PhD in 2002 in science as applied to uh, applied science to environment from the University of Alvaro She also has a MSc in specialized translation from University of Alvaro Presently, she is working as assistant professor in the environment and planning department at the University of Alvaro. Her research interests are centered on centered on biological processes for water water treatment, water and wastewater treatments, energetic uh, energetic violation of wastewater and waste. Her PhD thesis focuses on the development of novel strategy for operation of aplo and aerobic sludge reactors towards the violation of waste, allowing the rising Up, uh, rising by up to 25 percentage of the bioenergy that is mean dairy production from industrial waste waters throughout her academic career she has participated either as a team member or as a ma main investigator in various scientific research projects in the subject of valorization of waste water and waste she has more than 60 scientific publications including 32 articles in peer reviewed journals conference proceedings and book chapters She has also done several works on consultancy and training in industrial services for the implementation of quality and environmental management systems. Professor Nadesh, please. May I share my screen now? Yeah, please share. Thank you, Dr. Din, uh, Dr. Din, uh, Nidesh. Um, I would like to stress that um, I also work with the CESAM, the um, Center for Environmental and Marine Studies from my university. Um, I would like to acknowledge the invitation made to me by Dr. Nidesh. Uh, it is a great pleasure to participate in this uh, webinar series, uh, and I hope that our collaboration will continue in the future. Um, I would like also to greet the assistant, the assistants, uh, the audience, and wish that uh, this webinar, um, this webinar, will be uh, useful for you in some way. Um, this webinar will focus on uh, the application of uh, USB reactors in wastewater treatment. Uh, as uh, Dr. Nidesh uh, Nide said, uh, this, is, uh, this is a subject that I have been working uh, with for the last uh, 25 years. So I will start uh, by showing the outline of this presentation. Um, as I consider that maybe not everybody in the assistant will be specialists in anaerobic uh, systems. I will start by explaining uh, what exactly are USB, uh, USB reactors and how they work. And then uh, I will focus the, uh, on the importance of the USB reactors uh, and worldwide use 
uh, and the types of wastewaters that they are applied to. Uh, then I will focus on the advantages and uh, limitations or problems that these systems have and some uh, design considerations. Uh, I will then introduce um, an innovation in, in the operation of UASB reactors, that is the intermittent operation, uh, and the main results and conclusions that we can take from this, um, uh, this type of operation. I, and then I will end with future perspectives and will be available for questions and discussions. So uh, one of the more uh, the most used systems for the treatment of uh, industrial wastewater is the upflow anaerobic sludge bed reactor UASB that was developed by Professor Gatzelatinga uh, in the Netherlands in the 70s 1970s. So this is a type of um, uh, a reactor system that consists of um, a vertical column uh, partially filled with an anaerobic sludge bed um, through which the wastewater passes in an ascending uh, flow. Um, the feed is provided from the bottom of the reactor. It is uh, distributed uniformly and ascends through the sludge bed that is retained inside the reactor by gravity. So in the lower part of the reactor, we have a sludge bed, a thick sludge. Uh, then in the intermediate part, we have a sludge blanket that is a sludge that is not so thick as in the sludge bed. Um, and then we have a liquid phase because uh, as I said, the sludge is retained inside the reactor by gravity and the treated effluent is withdrawn from the top, as is also the formed biogas. So, um, here we have uh, a photo of uh, a real scale UASB installation. As you can see, it is a tubular uh, vertical reactor. Uh, and this, we have a schematic figure on the right. Uh, where we can see the sludge bed and the sludge blanket uh, and also the separation devices that are crucial in this kind of uh, reactor. They are needed to separate uh, the sludge from the rising liquid and the rising uh, biogas. So let's see in some detail how the system works. So as I said, the reactor is uh, usually a tubular vertical uh, reactor. Um, and uh, it has a gas solid liquid separator on the top uh, and uh, a kind of a sedimentation tank or internal sedimentation tank on top. And on the bottom of the reactor, there is the sludge bed. Uh, this is um, the biological sludge, the microorganisms that have um, the task of um, uh, decomposing uh, the organic matter that is present in the wastewater. Uh, then the feed is uh, provided from the bottom of the reactor uh, and it ascends to the top of the reactor um, being in uh, uh, close contact with the microorganisms. And this is what brings about the degradation of the organic matter. And then the treated effluent is collected on the top of the sedimentation tank. Uh, and it can be usually, uh, usually it is necessary to make a polishing step because as you probably know, you, um, anaerobic reactors do not provide uh, discharge quality uh, effluent. And then we have uh, the biogas that is also ascending through the reactor from the bottom to the top and is collected on the top of the reactor and can be used for um, energy production, whatever. Uh, one thing that is very important in UASB reactors 
uh, or at least the classical and initial USB reactors that were developed in the Netherlands in the 70s is the formation of um, a granular uh, sludge. But um, this granular sludge is not always necessary. Uh, and it is more adequate for highly soluble uh, wastewaters um, because, for example, if we have a complex wastewater like a dairy wastewater, um, we hardly see uh, granulation. And if we see the reactor with granular sludge, we will find that the granular sludge is lost when we operate the reactor with the complex fat containing wastewater. So um, let's see now some uh, critical elements in the design of the UASB reactors. First, we have the feed distribution system. Um, this is to avoid short uh, circuit of the, of the liquid. We also need a very good gas solid liquid separator uh, because we need to, to um, avoid a sludge washout. So the, the gas solid liquid separator is very important. Uh, there are some modifications of the UASB reactor, like for example, an external separator or filling, which would be a, like a kind of hybrid um, system. So the key factor in the operation of UASB reactors, uh, classical USB reactors is the development of a granular uh, biomass with excellent sedimentation characteristics because this is what keeps the, the biomass inside the system. So at the bottom in the bed, in the sludge bed, the solids will be about uh, 50 grams per liter to 100 grams per liter. Uh, and um, at the top in the blanket, the solids will have, will have a lower concentration for, from five to 40 grams per liter. And the particle uh, diameters, the, the granules diameters will range from one to three millimeters. Um, but uh, we, I will show you photos where we can uh, reach um, granules that are around uh, one centimeter or more. Um, so, but this granular sludge takes uh, several months to form. So usually we see the reactor, we buy the granular sludge. Uh, it is very expensive uh, and we buy it uh, in order to avoid this long um, startup time. Uh, but the key factors for granulation is the pH that must be neutral, the upflow liquid velocity, um, because uh, it has to, it has to um, exert some, some pressure in order to uh, wash out the slow growing microorganisms uh, that uh, do not uh, granulate and also the nutrient addition. So we have a higher uh, nutrient requirements in the startup uh, as compared to the requirements of nutrients in the steady state operation. Uh, in what concerns the wastewater characteristics, we have uh, many substrates that affect granulation or that form foams, and these are a problem. And these substrates are mainly uh, proteins and fats. Um, if we have loads from 12 to 20 kilograms uh, cubic meter per day, the removal efficiency will be around 90 to 95% at mesophilic temperatures and with hydraulic retention times from four to eight hours. Uh, also, the, the um, characteristics of the wastewater that we want to treat are important in project and uh, dimensioning and in system applicability. Uh, the higher the, the content of solids in the wastewater, um, the lower the capacity for developing a, gl a granular biomass. So if we have total suspended solids um, over six grams per six gram per liter, uh, other processes are preferable. Uh, but also we can use the um, UASB reactor with flocculent sludge instead of granular sludge. Um, and we can see here 
uh, that um, when we have high uh, percentage of suspended solids, it is preferable to use flocculent sludge instead of granular sludge. But of course, when the percentage of uh, particulate COD is very high, is over 60%, uh, it is better to use another type of reactor and not the sludge bed reactor. Uh, also, the, as I said before, the um, uh, liquid upflow velocity is a critical parameter for uh, the segregation of uh, microbial group. Um, it is uh, uh, one of the, because it exerts a kind of a, a selective pressure. Um, and this is one of the most important uh, factors for the granulation of the sludge. Uh, then we can uh, we have here some um, very basic equations about how to calculate the volume and the size of the reactor. Uh, this is not really rocket science. This is uh, usually um, very straightforward uh, with the uh, organic loading rate. Uh, the feed flow and the feed from the, C, uh, the COD of the feed, we can easily calculate the volume that is occupied by the sludge bed and the sludge blanket. So this is not uh, very difficult. And so the total volume is usually calculated using an effectivity, an effectivity factor that is uh, equivalent to the fraction that is occupied uh, by the sludge bed and the sludge blanket. And these ranges usually from 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. And so by applying the uh, effectiv effectivity factor, we can calculate the total volume of the reactor. And then uh, having the total volume and the area, we can calculate the total uh, the area, the, um, the height of the reactor. And then we have to account for uh, the height of the biogas chamber, okay, so that we can reach the total height being the liquid height and the uh, height of the biogas chamber. We have to sum these two components in order to reach the total height of the reactor. Um, there are some sp uh, specific um, UASB devices that are very important. Uh, one of them is the feed distribution system. Usually, it is a system of uh, perforated tubing. This is um, to avoid channeling. Uh, and this is more critical for less concentrated feeds. Um, in this case, there is less bio, uh, biogas production. Um, and biogas production helps homogenization of the, of the contents of the reactor and of the sludge bed. So if we have less concentrated feeds, we have less biogas production and we have less homogenization. So, and this brings about the more importance of the feed distribution system. Then we have the biogas collection and separation of solids. So we usually have a gas solid liquid separator uh, that has a function to collect the biogas to avoid the solids uh, loss or solids washout um separate the biogas from the solids and allow the return of the the solids to the bed to the sludge bed so here we have uh, an example of uh, a feed distribution system and uh, as, uh, as i said it is uh, perforated tubing usually and here we have um the gas solid liquid separation uh, separation devices, uh, but uh, these uh, separation devices they don't function very well for uh, complex uh, wastewaters or fat com containing wastewaters. For example, uh, the wastewaters from uh, dairy industries, milk processing industries, cheese industries, um, they don't work very well. Uh, an upgrade of the um, UASB reactor is the EGSB reactor, expanded granular sludge bed. Um, this is uh, almost uh, similar to a UASB reactor, but it is uh, longer, it is higher than a UASB reactor, 
and um, the upflow velocity is much higher than the one that is used in the UESB reactor. And this is brought about mainly, <coughs> sorry, uh, mainly because we have effluent recirculation and this effluent recirculation will raise the upflow velocity inside the reactor. And this, um, up, this higher upflow uh, velocity will expand uh, the granular sludge bed. And this um, gives the name uh, to the reactor, expanded granular sludge bed. Okay, so um, nowadays um, this um, upgrade of UASB reactor, the EGSB reactor, is uh, gaining uh, market uh, whilst UASB reactors are uh, stabilizing, uh, as we can see um, in the next slide. So um, it was a very good idea uh, of uh, Professor Gatza Latinga. Um, he had a very great uh, breakthrough uh, in anaerobic systems as sludge bed uh, anaerobic reactors like the UASB or the e EGSB are um, the, the anaerobic systems that are most spread uh, worldwide. Um, just to give you an idea, we have here uh, the sales of anaerobic high rate reactors by uh, the two largest, um, uh, in this slide and in the next one, the two largest commercial contractors. Um, here we have um, PAC and we can, uh, we can clearly see uh, the steep rise in sludge bed reactors, meaning uh, UASB reactors and EGSB reactors. And a similar trend is found for uh, Biotain Veolia that is uh, also another contractor um, selling this kind of technology. In fact, um, more than uh, um, of the more than uh, 4,000 4, uh, high rate anaerobic systems installed uh, worldwide, around 90% are sludge bed reactor, meaning um, UASB or EGSB. Um, so this type of reactors are almost all the reactors that in, are installed worldwide for several types of uh, uh, wastewaters. So we see here um, uh, the main types of industries that use uh, anaerobic systems for their wastewaters. Um, the agrofood is uh, the largest, followed by beverages and uh, pulp and paper. Uh, but it is important uh, to stress that uh, the types of wastewaters that may be treated in anaerobic systems and specifically in sludge bed systems um, is rapidly expanding. However, uh, this is not without problems. Uh, in fact, uh, there are some types of wastewaters uh, that are very problematic uh, in terms of biological treatment. Uh, one example are uh, the dairy wastewaters from uh, milk processing industries or cheese or other milk derived products. These are con uh, considered um, complex fat containing wastewaters and their main constituents are sugars, uh, proteins and fats. Uh, and so what happens uh, when we apply a UASB reactor to the treatment of such complex fat containing wastewaters. Um, so when we have a, a, a long time continuous operation of UASB reactors with fat containing substrates, what happens is that um, we find a high degree of organic matter accumulation in the sludge bed. <laughs> Sorry, um, this accumulation in the sludge bed brings about uh, sludge deterioration, sludge washout, um, and uh, ultimately the reactor failure. We have some examples of this uh, happening in our uh, laboratory reactors. 
uh, where we see that uh, we have kind of a breakthrough, a fat breakthrough or a, a VSS breakthrough. Uh, we see that uh, the organic matter rises through the reactor until uh, up to the um, um, separator uh, without being degraded. So it accumulates inside the reactor. We also see here um, on the left side um, the rise of the uh, sludge bed. This is a phenomenon that is uh, more uh, observed in uh, laboratory reactors and not in real scale reactors. But on the right, we can see a lump of organic matter that is not being degraded uh, inside the reactor. So this is fats and proteins. So um, so these problems uh, of accumulation of uh, uh, organic matter inside the reactors, they bring about um, low production of methane, obviously, because the organic matter is not being degraded. Uh, and so low methanization and low valorization of the substrate, because we have to see this uh, anaerobic technology not only from the perspective of the treatment of the wastewater, but also uh, from the perspective of uh, reapping some um, resources. And it is possible to, as you know, to produce energy from uh, anaerobic systems. But if the organic matter is accumulating inside the reactors without being degraded, then we do not have a high methanization efficiency. So um, to increase the biogas production and decrease the percentage accumulation of organic matter inside the reactors, we had to find, um, seek an, an alternative solution. Uh, because we uh, experimented by uh, raising the hydraulic retention time. And uh, when we raise the hydraulic retention time um, up to 16 hours, uh, then this is the maximum benefit that we can react. So we had to find an alternative solution. And this was uh, the intermittent operation. So we, this is a novel. Um, um, strategy to operate UASB reactors with flocculent sludge in order to maximize um, the production of methane from the uh, complex wastewater. So what is intermittent operation? Um, intermittent operation is a sequence of feed and feedless periods um, this means that um, we do not operate the reactor in a continuous way. We operate it um, in a sequence of feed periods uh, followed by feedless or stabilization periods. And um, a pair of feed periods followed by a stabilization or feedless period constitutes what we call one cycle or one run. And so the intermittent operation is a sequence of feed and feedless periods. Um, uh, so feed uh, followed by feedless uh, periods. This means that we interrupt the continuous operation of the reactor. This is very simple. Uh, so what do we think happens during the feed period? So we have a flocculent sludge uh, and we have also a complex fat containing substrate like uh, uh, dairy wastewater. So what happens during the feed period? What happens during the feed period is that um, when, the, when the wastewater gets in contact with the flocculent sludge, it absorbs, as you know, probably it absorbs into the surface of the of the um, the, uh, the flocks, and this um, brings about flocculent sludge surrounded, <coughs> sorry, by a film of absorbed organic matter. So, uh, what will happen then 
during the stabilization period. So due to the high hydrolytic and acidogenic activity of the flocculent sludge, uh, this, um, this uh, uh, surface um, organic matter will be degraded, uh, the sludge will be restored, and we will have biogas production. So this is the, the principle of working of uh, the, um, the feed feedless or intermittent UASB reactor. So we uh, had some laboratory experiments on this in which we use semi-skimmed milk. Uh, we use the hydraulic retention time of 12 hours and we use two reactors, one intermittent reactor with 48 hours feed followed by 48 hours feedless or stabilization. This, uh, so each cycle was 48 hours feed followed by 48 hours feedless. And then we also, um, in parallel, we operated a continuous reactor. Um, as the intermittent reactor has feedless periods, in order to have the same global load, the feed in the intermittent reactor has to be doubled, uh, the feed of the uh, continuous reactor. Okay, so here in this experiment, we had um, an intermittent reactor with four, uh, around 15,000 milligrams per liter of COD in the feed and um, the continuous was around uh, 7,600. 7, uh, uh, so more or less uh, <coughs> half the concentration. And here we have uh, the pattern um, of the effluent in the intermittent uh, UASB reactor. So we see that uh, the VSS, um, they rise in the first um, 24 hours, but uh, when we go from the, the first 24 hours to the 48 hours, the VSS lowers. Uh, and it lowers a lot also during the stabilization period. And the, a similar pattern can be observed for the soluble COD. Uh, the COD removal efficiencies from the intermittent and the, and the continuous reactors were very similar, 98% uh, for, the, for the intermittent reactor and 99% for the continuous reactor. Uh, other parameters like VFA uh, were lower in the um, continuous reactor, a pH was uh, similar, uh, and VSS was higher in intermittent reactor. In terms of methane production, we see that uh, we had a uh, higher um, methane production uh, in the intermittent uh, reactor as compared to continuous reactor. Um, so we have in each cycle, so each cycle here was uh, four days. Uh, we had 23.6 uh, um, liters uh, for the intermittent reactor and for the continuous reactor, we had 20.4. So when we do the calculations for the methanization of the removed COD, we can see here um, that we have um, around uh, 20 to 25 percent higher methanization of the removed COD in the intermittent reactor. We also performed some specific methanogenic activity of the different sludges from the two reactors with the different substrates. So in the, the green color is the original sludge that was equal for both reactors is the initial inoculum. Um, the, the orange is the sludge from the continuous reactor and the blue is the sludge from the intermittent reactor. Um, and we can see um, that the sludge from the intermittent UASB reactor 
has high specific methanogenic activity for complex substrates as compared to the original inoculum sludge or the sludge from the continuous UASB reactor. So um, this was uh, an observation. The, the, um, the specific methanogenic activity is higher for the sludge from the intermittent reactor, especially for the complex substrates like skimmed milk and especially semi-skimmed milk that has some fat. Then we performed also some macroscopic analysis of the sludge. Uh, and we see here that the sludge looks di different uh, from the intermittent and from the continuous system, as you can see. So uh, the, the um, continuous system uh, was more granular and the intermittent system, the sludge worm was more flocculent. And here we found also some differences in the granules. Uh, the granules here are quite high, quite, quite uh, big, um, as you can see. Uh, and there were some difference in the structure of the granules, in the internal structure of the granules from the continuous and the intermittent uh, reactors. And then we performed also some microscopic analysis of the sludge. This is the original sludge that was fed to um, both reactors. Uh, and here we can find, this is the microscopic analysis of the sludge from the continuous and the intermittent reactors. And we could find uh, differences um, both in terms of the uh, uh, aggregation of the, the microorganisms and also on the type of microorganisms that were found in the intermittent and in the continuous reactors. Uh, and more striking differences we could find in the supernatant of the sludge between the continuous and uh, intermittent reactors. So we can find here um, the supernatant of the continuous reactor, we can find long chains of uh, organisms, whilst in the uh, intermittent reactors, we could find more dispersed microorganisms. This is uh, agreeing with the fact that we can find more um, granular sludge in the continuous system as compared to the intermittent system. So these observations um, uh, led us to um, establish uh, a research question or a research uh, hypothesis. Um, and this was that the, there was a forced uh, adaptation or a selective pressure of the biomass uh, to adapt to complex substrates during the stabilization or feedless period. Um, so our hypothesis was that intermittent operation causes alterations in the biomass, in the microbial population, towards a better adaptation to the degradation of complex substrates. Meaning that um, during the feedless periods, probably uh, some selective pressure is uh, applied uh, in order to um, the population to adapt to the more complex substrates that are uh, present in the, in the wastewater. So for this, we did a similar experiment with two USB reactors uh, at mesophilic temperature, inoculated with flocculent sludge, fed with synthetic dairy wastewater. Uh, the USB reactor uh, uh, intermittent was um, in the cycle of 48 hours feed and 48 hours feedless with the hydraulic retention time of 12 hours during the feed period. Uh, and the continuous reactor was also with hydraulic retention time of 12 hours. And we experimented, this was a startup experiment. And we started with um, a global load of one gram COD per liter per day, and then four grams COD per liter per day. And we monitored and we operated these reactors for 44 days. And so uh, we also um, used uh, molecular techniques 
for biomass characterization, uh, namely uh, fluorescence, fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH. Uh, we did this for the initial inoculum that was the same for both reactors. And we took samples from the two uh, UASB reactors after 44 days of uh, startup operation. Um, so for the fish assays, um, a whole cell liberalization protocol was used. I'm not going to, into details with this, uh, but we have the three probes and the bacteria domain uh, was conjugated with the fixed uh, probe, the archaea with the CI3 and um, the Centrophomonas SP with CI5 probe. Why is this Centrophomonas important? This is a key microbial group for the degradation of fats and oils uh, in anaerobic systems. So this is one of the most important groups uh, that we had to monitor in order to see if there is in fact um, an adaptation of the biomass uh, for a degrading uh, complex substrates. So here are, is a scheme of the protocol. I'm not going to um, detail on this. And here we have some, um, some um, operation data uh, for the startup of the two UASB reactors. So the global load um, was uh, starting with one gram COD per liter per day. And then we passed to two uh, grams COD per liter per day. And the COD removal efficiency was the same for both reactors, 98 to 99%. And the average methane production was 1.7 liters of methane per day in the continuous reactor and 2.2 um, uh, liters of methane per day in the intermittent reactor. So this is around 30% <coughs> higher in the intermittent reactor. Uh, so the average methanization efficiency uh, for the continuous reactor was 44% and for the intermittent reactor it was 59%. These methanization efficiencies are not very high because we are in the startup period, okay, only with 44 days of operation. Uh, and the maximum BFA concentration was higher in the intermittent uh, reactor than in the continuous reactor. So um, here we have um, the results uh, for um, the inoculum, uh, inoculum uh, sludge. So we took samples from the initial inoculum um, and from the two reactors after the 44 days of operation. And so these are the results for the initial um, inoculum. Uh, and we see that uh, the archaea group has a relative abundance of 41% and the bacterial group, which includes the syntrophic group, reaches 59%. 3% of which belong to the syntrophic group, that is the key uh, microbial group for the degradation of fats and oils in the dairy wastewater. So here we have the results for uh, the continuous reactor. And we see here that uh, at the end of the study period, that means uh, day 44, the most abundant group in the continuous reactor was from the bacteria domain. Uh, so 60, uh, 56%. Um, this is what all, was also observed in the inoculum sludge. Okay, we also have high um, bacterial domain. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the relative abundance of bacterial microorganisms in the continuous reactor was um, was 62 percent. I'm sorry, not not uh, 56, uh, 52 percent, and this is 12 percent lower than the in, in the initial uh, reactor, initial inoculum. 
and the organisms from the Archaea group reached 48%, uh, which amounts to an increase of 70%. So it is important to notice also that the Cintrophomonas group, uh, the key microbial group for the degradation of fats, um, it was present in the initial inoculum, uh, but was absent in the continuous reactor after 44 days of operation. Uh, the disappearance of this group uh, related to the conversion of long chain fatty acids in anaerobic systems is um, probably due to the low hydraulic retention time that was applied in this work, 12 hours, uh, which was much lower than the hydraulic retention time of a uh, full uh, scale continuous uh, reactor from which the inoculum was taken. That was 6.5 days. And here we have um, the results, the flood characterization for the intermittent UASB reactor. Uh, the most abundant group of organisms belong to the archaea domain, so 61%, a raise of 49% as compared to the inoculum. Uh, these results are consistent with uh, the higher methane production obtained in the intermittent reactor. Uh, the bacterial group decreased from 59% to 39%, a decrease of 40, uh, 48%. And uh, the Cintrophomonas group related to the long chain fatty acids met metabolization reached 10% of the total microorganisms, an increase of 230% compared to the inoculum. Um, the relative abundance of the Cintrophomona group uh, present in the intermittent system is higher than what has been reported for anaerobic reactors treating lipid containing wastewaters. Uh, so the, these results show that the intermittent mode of operation improves the biomass capacity to metabolize complex substrates present in milk processing wastewaters, because we can see that the intermittent operation fosters the development, the growth of key microbial species or groups that are important for the degradation of the complex substrates that appear in um, dairy wastewater. So um, as conclusions, uh, the intermittent operation allows COD removal efficiencies as high as uh, the continuous systems and around 98, 99%. For the same applied load, um, the intermittent operation results in methane productions that are higher than those obtained with continuous operation indicating a more complete biological uh, degradation of the organic matter that is removed in the reactor. Uh, the specific methanogenic activity of the biomass from the intermittent reactor was higher than, was, than what was obtained with the biomass from the continuous reactor or with the original sludge. This difference being more pronounced for the more complex substrates. So the more complex the substrate, the more pronounced the difference between the specific methanogenic activity of um, the biomass from the intermittent and the continuous reactor. Um, the original sludge and the sludge from the continuous reactor showed some inhibition effects by the complex substrate, namely uh, semi-skimmed milk, uh, which the sludge from the intermittent reactor did not present. So the intermittent reactor or the intermittent operation mode causes uh, significant changes in the biomass that is developed in the reactor as compared to what was observed in the continuous system. These uh, differences are, are both at macroscopic level in terms of the color, the size of the flocks, and the structure of the flocks. And in the terms of microscopic level, um, the types of microorganisms, filamentous, cocos, rods, 
and the types of association between the microorganisms. And also we saw that uh, the intermittent operation brings about, in fact, um, a growth um, in the uh, microbial groups that are key for the degradation of fats uh, in the uh, complex uh, fat containing substrates. So um, this is important. Uh, so this work uh, de demonstrates um, the use of intermittent operation uh, as a valuable strategy for anaerobic reactors uh, that results in the adaptation of the microbial populations to the metabolization of complex fat containing wastewaters. So as a consequence of this uh, adaptation in the biomass, the intermittent anaerobic reactors presents higher methane productions than the continuous system uh, thus improving the potential uh, of uh, energy production from the waste. So future uh, perspectives, um, we are working on uh, application of intermittent UASB reactors for the removal of other complex substrates, uh, completely different from agrofood uh, wastewaters. Um, and especially those that have high absorption capacity, because those that have high absorption capacity will be absorbed into the sludge during the feed period, and then they will remain there to be degraded during the feedless period. And also, we are monitoring the microbial populations through high throughput molecular techniques also. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm available for discussion now. Thank you, madam. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Madam, please uh, stop sharing your slides so that we can go for uh, uh, discussion. Okay, thank you. So directly we can go for a panel discussion. Dr. Yes. George K. Varghese, please raise your questions. Okay. George, yeah. uh, you're able to hear me, no? Yeah, yeah, yes, proceed. Okay. So just, uh, madam, uh, normally in uh, any anaerobic process, alkalinity is an issue, right? Yes. We may add alkalinity externally. I'm sorry? Uh, we may have to add alkalinity externally, you know, because especially- yes, when... we have to. we have to add some alkalinity, yes. Okay. So like, uh, especially you were talking about that glucose-based reactor and all, where uh, I think uh, chances of alkalinity production within the reactor is very less because glucose means it is only starch, carbohydrate. So uh, uh, how much like, uh, what would be the additional cost? In the, because it is a very fast process, right? We didn't, uh, we didn't operate the UASB reactors with glucose. We only operated with uh, dairy wastewater. Uh, no, in one of your comparisons, it was glucose was also given, it seems. But it was only a batch uh, test. Okay, it was only a batch test. Okay, okay, okay. For specific methanogenic activity. Okay, 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 fine. Uh, then uh, another thing, uh, like uh, as you said, granular sludge is very important for the process, right? Yes. Granular sludge. And uh, you were mentioning that you buy granular sludge. Right? Uh, no, 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 I didn't buy granular sludge. Usually, no, usually operations because you were mentioning about uh, some something on that of that sort. No, granular sludge. Uh, yeah, I remember you said some conditions for uh, making the sludge granular. Yes. But other than that, you were mentioning about uh, purchase of granular sludge, something like that. No. I'm sorry. You didn't uh, tell about purchasing granular sludge. Some, come, I mean, you you said no. It is very costly and all granular sludge. Yes, yes, it's costly, and uh, we don't need granular sludge. The okay. the the first the first UASB reactors um, were operated uh, with the granular sludge, but it is possible uh, and better, uh, depending on the wastewater, to use flocculent sludge. Flocculent sludge. Okay, okay, okay. And then I was wondering, uh, with your intermittent system, the hydraulic retention time, effective hydraulic retention time, would be doubled, no? 
um, no, um, it is a difficult concept because during the feed period, it is working like a continuous system. Yeah, but then uh, there is some period for which it is lying idle, right? Yeah, yes. Yes, um, but we don't consider uh, we don't consider that uh, hydraulic retention time for the idle period for the feedless period. Uh, no, no, because then it is working like a batch reactor, so uh, it makes no sense to to talk about hydraulic retention time. Okay, but at the same time, when you talk about a practical case, say you have a definite volume of feed coming in. And you need to, when you design the volume, you need to consider that. No, then you may have to have two parallel systems, right? So yes. effectively, you are doubling the volume, right? Yes. Uh, in practice, if I uh, operate um, an intermittent system and I want to have a continuous treatment, I have to have a double system. Double system. Uh, okay. So uh, in effect, actually, uh, like your capacity is, you know, the volumetric capacity is being halved when you adopt, uh, that becomes half when you adopt intermittent system. No? Um, so is that not a, you know, a, a big compromise that you're making? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Uh, pardon? No. Uh, sorry, uh, there is some issue. Uh, you're able to hear me? Yes. Uh, no, uh, the thing is, uh, there is some problem with my connection. Okay, so uh, when we design a system, yes, you need to consider the, see, when you consider the, uh, when uh, we consider the volumetric loading, for example. Yes. So then uh, say if you have a, con a, a definite volume of feed coming in, then you will require, uh, had it been a continuous one, whatever volume you require, twice that will be required for intermittent, no? Um, no, the volume is the same. Uh, usually wh what we do is that we, um, to test the system and see the possibilities of the system, we operate the intermittent system with the double concentration. Okay. Because um, it has to be the double concentration in order to have the same global load because it is only operating half the time. Okay. So the concentration during the feed periods is doubled the concentration of the continuous reactor. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Hari Prasad Reddy, Dr. Hari Prasad Reddy. Please. Yeah, Nidish. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yes, uh, Madam, thank you for uh, enlightening us regarding a uh, UASB. I have few general questions regarding uh, USB. Uh, can you uh, throw some light on resistance of these biogranules uh, when there are some toxic substances, maybe like hydrogen sulfide or maybe some uh, aromatic pollutants or some heavy metals? So how we can take care of... Uh, well, um, I, I always operate my UASB reactors with flocculent sludge. Okay. Not granular sludge. Okay, okay. Um, but uh, because uh, I operate the, my reactors with uh, dairy wastewater. Okay. And dairy wastewater is recognized as not being able to develop granules. Sometimes we can find some granules in the reactors as I showed you in the presentation. But uh, if you start the reactor with the granular sludge that you buy very expensively and then you feed it with dairy wastewater, I think that you will probably lose the granules. Okay. 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 Yeah. One more question is uh, like, what are the uh, feasible post treatment techniques that we need to adopt after uh, UASB? You said no, that water, are... water quality will not be good. It has to be some polishing treatment need to be done. Yes, yes. yes, that's true. 
no uh, no aerobic systems uh, uh, gives a, a, a treated effluent quality uh, enough to be discharged in the receiving medium. You always need a polishing step. So usually that is uh, an aerobic uh, step. Okay. Like uh, activated sludge, a small activated sludge system or whatever. Okay, okay. Uh, with respect, respect to the uh, comparison with other treatment techniques, uh, so on the basis of its performance or maybe the resource recovery potential or maybe the cost, uh, how it is more effective compared to the other uh, treatment techniques? Well, um, depending on what treatment techniques you choose, but the anaerobic system is by, by nature um, okay. the center of a circular economy because you use um, a, a waste okay. and you transform this waste into a valuable uh, byproduct that okay. is energy rich like the biogas okay okay so and also these these um uh, sludge bed reactors they have many advantages in, in terms of cost for example compared with the filter reactors um filter reactors have some problems with the clogging um and have some problems because the 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 um, the filling is expensive usually. Um, so uh, these sludge bed reactors, I think, are a, a better option. Okay. Yeah, and and last question. To, yeah. And compared to um, other uh, treatment options, because they are anaerobic, they have very good advantages in terms of uh, um, contributing to uh, lowering the um, co2 emissions okay okay uh one uh, one last question uh, the gas that is produced the biogas that is produced eh? so whether that can be directly used or we need to treat again uh, we need to do some treatment before uh, using it yes you need to do a treatment before you use it even if it's just to burn it you need to treat it because uh, depending on the wastewater that you uh, treat, depending okay. on the wastewater that you use to produce the biogas, if it has some sulfur compounds, it okay. will produce uh, sulfidic acid uh, that is very corrosive. Okay. So you have to clean the biogas. At okay. least you have to clean the biogas from these components. Okay. And if you want, and then depending on the use that you want for the biogas or the biomethane, uh, you will have to uh, upgrade it. Okay. It's okay. not possible to use it directly. Okay. Okay. Then what is the uh, uh, like uh, the time period required for the discharge of this the water the sludge that is being accumulated in a reactor? So uh, how long we need to? There is no practically there is no accumulation of sludge inside the reactors. The, the, the VSS that are coming out from the treated effluent um, are all the, the sludge that we need to take out. Okay. I have been operating reactors for years and we don't need to take out any uh, sludge. Okay. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. for it. Yeah, Thank you, Reddy, sir. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Arun Kumar, please raise your questions. Hello. Yeah, proceed. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nidesh, for giving me opportunity to listen to this very uh, fruitful and interesting subject. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nadis, for giving excellent presentation uh, lecture on this BSP for way for our teacher. Your presentation was quite uh, elaborative and systematic. And almost many of the things you have covered for USP, which general researchers are not doing, they are only maintaining for either for flood pad or some biogas, but you involved everything in that. So I appreciate your research. Work. Thank you very much for giving uh, such a nice information. I have some uh, queries uh, and some uh, point for discussion of the PSP. Uh, my, uh, like uh, uh, one uh, thing you asked, uh, you told that uh, proteins and fats, generally when uh, this uh, waste water kind of things are utilized, Form is generated. 
so that GLSS DLSS is not working efficiently. In that case, uh, what was the reason? The reason is that um, uh, when the wastewater has proteins, the proteins tend to to form uh, uh, scums um, and foams. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and when the, the wastewater also has grease or, or um, uh, fats and oils, uh, they tend to float. And so the GLS separator is not so effective for these kinds of wastewaters. Okay, so in that case, what modification you did so that you, you could get biogas? Have you, did, Sorry? Uh, have you changed some uh, the design uh, aspect of GLSS so that you could get the biogas generated in the system? I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Uh, any Anything you change in the design of GLSS for such kind of waste because uh, of okay. any forms are generated in your wastewater? No, no, no. I didn't change anything in the design of the reactor. What I changed was the operation. When you operate the reactor, for uh, for example, two days, okay. continuously. At the end of the two days, you have um, a, 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 a sludge layer on top of the separator. Yeah, scum layer kind of thing. Okay, you have a sludge and organic matter layer on top of the separator because the grease and the proteins they extend to the top of the reactor. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, I didn't change anything in the design. The only thing that I did was stop the reactor, stop the feed, and keep the temperature, of course, keep the mesophilic temperature. And at the end of the two days, without feed, this uh, uh, scum layer on top of the sedimenter, on top of the reactor, was degraded. Yeah. Okay? So I don't need uh, to design a new separator. I just need to interrupt the feed to the reactor. Okay, give it time to degrade the accumulated organic matter. Okay. 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 Uh, one clarification is also required. Like generally for uh, op operation and maintenance, it is said that whatever scum layer is available on the effluent side of USB, it should be clean. Okay. And, and even you told that no uh, sludge is withdrawn from USB reactor. Uh, you answer to uh, Dr. Reddy's question. And whatever effluent is coming out, it, it contains sludge, flocculent sludge kind of thing, having a very high SS uh, suspended solid kind of thing. So uh, how in that case, COD, uh, removal is achieved because more sludge is coming out means it is considered as washout kind of thing. So how is COD is removed in that case? Um, I, I'm not sure if I understand exactly what you mean. What is your question? Okay, my question is that uh, because recently you answered for a discussion that you are not withdrawing sludge from the reactor. Yes. And yes. The sludge which is generated, it is coming out as a washout sludge. Yes. So because of that, your COD in the effluent would be very high. So how COD removed is almost 98 to 99 percent uh, as per results. Because uh, in uh, um, biological systems, we are to calculate the uh, removal efficiency with the total COD in and the soluble COD out. Yes. Okay, so you, you measured soluble theory, almost 98 percent. To calculate the efficiency, I use the total COD that's going in and the okay. soluble COD that's going out because uh, the VSS is not from the substrate. Okay, the VSS that is coming out is not from the milk uh, or, or the, subs the initial substrate that I am uh, putting inside the reactor. Okay, so um, it is a biomass that is formed inside the reactor and it is being washed out. Okay? Yes. 
So to calculate the efficiency, I calculate it with uh, total COD coming in because all the COD that is coming in is biodegradable. Yes. But uh, the um, COD that is coming out, I use the soluble COD. Okay. But is it uh, because ultimately the sludge which is available in the USB reactor that will come out. So certainly that will be solubilized and because of the solubilization uh, soluble COD may, may increase. Sorry? Soluble COD may increase because of the, the solubilization of the sludge which is available in the batter blanket. Well, but it, it didn't solubilize because the, the VSS that is coming out is the uh, excess sludge that is produced inside the reactor. It's not okay. solubilizing because it's biomass. Okay. Okay. Next. Next question. Uh, you talked about expanded granular sludge bed reactor. Uh, again, uh, I thought that it must have poor settleability kind of issues. Is it? Is it so? It must have what? Poor. Poor settleability. Settleability. No. Of, this of is the. the um, the, the granular sludge that is developed inside the EGSB reactor is, is uh, very settleable. Okay. Is, is, uh, is, is really uh, very um, heavy granules. Hmm. Otherwise, the system will not work. The, the EGSB reactor does not work with flocculent sludge. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, one more question. Uh, in intermittent, uh, what was the pH in the reactor? Because uh, somewhere you told that high hydrolate, uh, hydraulic and acetogenic activity, you got uh, better efficiency. Uh, because of that pH variation was uh, how much? How much pH was varied in this? Uh, usually, if if you put uh, some um, uh, dairy wastewater that tends to acidify very quickly. For example, that has a pH of six, uh, but uh, th there is a we we also add some alkalinity to the reactor, uh, and it has a natural buffer capacity, and the uh, outcoming flow has a pH of about seven seven and a half. Okay. Uh, in uh, intermediate, can we go uh, with the uh, granular sludge? Uh, the the, um, the type of sludge the type of sludge that you get inside the USB reactor is not mainly dependent on the, the the strategy of operation but more on the wastewater you use. Okay, okay. so I use intermittent uh, reactors with dairy wastewater, and dairy wastewater is known to be a very bad for granulation. Yes. Because of the fats, mainly yes. because of the fats. Okay, so uh, this is why I use flocculent sludge. But even with flocculent sludge, as I thought, as I uh, I showed you, there can be some granule formation. Ah, yes. I showed you some granules. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I, I was not I was not aiming at forming granules, but the, uh, okay. they appear. Okay. Okay. They were formed. Okay, so can we think biphasic reactor uh, uh, compared to or in place of uh, intermittent uh, reactor kind of thing, biphasic? Sorry? Biphasic reactor means uh, initially in one reactor uh, we must have acetogenic kind of phase and uh, then it will send to USB reactor for better efficiency in two reactors. Uh, if we can have... Uh, um two phase reactors in intermittent mode is it your question no no uh, but if if I, I want to replace intermittent kind of thing so can i have a biphasic reactor kind of thing can i use the biphasic reactor uh, for replacing intermittent kind uh, almost intermittent itself is, is biphasic kind of thing uh, as i get it 
No, the intermittent is not the by by um, a B phase reactor. It, it is B phase in the, in the, in um, in that uh, you have a first phase that is feed 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 phase in which mainly adsorption of complex substrates occur onto the sludge. Um, so there is removal, but there is no degradation. And then in the feedless period, you have the degradation. Okay, you have to give time for the biological sludge to degrade the accumulated substrates in the sludge bed. Okay, but this has, is, is uh, completely different from a, a biphase reactor in which the first phase is acidogenic and the second phase is methanogenic. This is completely different. So if, if overall I re, I reduce or oh sorry I increase the HRT of the reactor, USB reactor, so it will not work because ultimately our interest is USB reactor or the microbes or bacteria must have a retention time so that it can treat effectively the, the waste or substrate. So more HRT, more better treatment kind of thing. Is it we can? Get uh, it depends. The, 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 the intermittent reactor is especially adequate for substrates that tend to absorb, like fats and proteins that tend to absorb to the sludge. Okay, so okay. they absorb to the sludge. Um, and here the uh, hydraulic retention time you need is only the necessary to uh, bring this absorption um, as higher as possible. And okay. when the sludge is saturated with organic matter, then you stop the feed. You stop the reactor. And then you let uh, the biomass, you let the, the microorganisms degrade the absorbed organic matter. Until the sludge, until the sludge comes clean again, okay. And it is in in the this feedless period that you have the most um, biogas production, okay. So the the first phase, the feed phase, is a, a kind of a removal, is removal without degradation. Okay. Okay, and the feedless phase is degradation. Okay, in the feedless phase, the reactor works as a batch reactor okay. that has a lot of accumulated organic matter and will degrade this accumulated organic matter. Okay. okay. Uh, I have two uh, points for your comments. Like, uh, as USB is considered the most efficient treatment uh, technology compared to ASP. Uh, why still in all over the world yes, people are using ASP? Why is still uh, USB is not available everywhere? Why still ASP is a preferred kind of technology? Uh, because um, <clears throat> because uh, these uh, designs usually are uh, from commercial companies. And uh, they are, yes, and they are very expensive. I showed you in the presentation. Uh, there are a contract, there are a commercial companies that sell these types of systems like EGSB or UASB. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it's not easy to build a, a real scale EGSB reactor. It has a lot of secrets. So this, oh. is, uh, this is why mainly it's not uh, so widespread. Okay. Uh, one more last last point for discussion. Uh, everywhere I read that almost seventy percent of uh, waste, what sewage? I'm talking about sewage. Uh, untreated, seventy percent untreated is discharged into aquatic environment throughout the world. So everyone is claiming that these SPPs are not working efficiently. So can you throw some light on that? I, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. I don't, I'm not, I'm not hearing very well. Okay, okay. Question is, uh, everywhere I read in the literature, 70% of untreated wastewater 
is discharged directly into aquatic environment. Ah, okay, yes. So it is said that uh, these STPs, PV treatment plants, are not working efficiently. Yes. So what is the reason behind that? Why seventy percent is uh, discharged? Well, this is because um, I think mainly the um, the the wastewater treatment plants are designed. They are constructed. Okay. But sometimes they are not adequate to the specific wastewater that they have to treat. It's a, it's a seaweed. Okay. And also, um, the wastewater treatment plant doesn't work by itself. It okay. needs uh, knowledge, technical knowledge to be operated. Okay. And it is... Um, some parts of the wastewater treatment plant are alive, so to say, are biological. So they need a lot of care to work pro pro uh, properly. Okay, so if you don't have these, for instance, in my country, we have a lot of wastewater treatment plants that were very expensive with very good designs and so on. But then we have no training people, uh, no people with um, uh, training to operate these uh, wastewater treatment plants. This is one example of why they are not working at their full potential. Okay. 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 Thank you, madam. Thank you, Aravind Kumar. Dr. Partha Kundu, please. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes, proceed, proceed, please. Yeah, Dr. Nidesh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, smoothly conducting the session. And uh, and uh, Dr. Nadesh, uh, thank you for overall uh, giving good presentation regarding this USB reactor. You are covering all the design aspects of this reactor. So some query regarding uh, the USB reactor. This is mainly USB reactor for, for fat containing wastewater, complex wastewater like dairy, or ice cube factory, it is very difficult to operate USB reactor. Initially, we already developed USB reactor, but when it's on the field, when you implement in case of rice mill factory, as well as ice cream factory, because it is complex nature of this wastewater, it is very difficult to operate USB reactor due to the formation of large scam and uh, flocculation and frothing, all this problem. So we are switching to USB to yeah, hybrid kind of USB reactor that is called BFPR that mitigate this issue. So I am interesting that you, in your case that you are coupling your continuous reactor with intermittent operation. So when the continuous operation, suppose in uh, industrial FTN, it is coming per day, which is treating 40 KLD or 30 KLD per day. So is it feasible to operate under this condition continuously with coupling intermittent as well as continuous? in both simultaneously? Yes. Um, we have a case in a real scale um, uh, dairy wastewater uh, plant uh, that, that was working during the weeks from Monday to Friday. Okay. And it was uh, uh, stopped uh, at uh, Sundays, uh, Saturdays and Sundays. Okay. And then so the wastewater treatment plant also had this um, uh, schedule of operation. And in fact, the, the performance of the reactor, the, 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 um, it, was, it was not a UASB, it was um, a completely mixed reactor, improved with this uh, intermittency, so to say. So when you have problems with the, like scum formation, uh, accumulation of organic matter, uh, flotation, what you have to do, uh, I think, is to stop the reactor for some days. Keep, okay. the, keep the temperature and stop the reactor for some days. Okay, but... And uh, it will improve. Okay, okay. So it, when it is improved, then normal continue operation, it will continue. Yes. Okay. One more thing uh, is that, uh, as you know, that for USB reactor, its performance basically depends on the type of the granules during the startup period or the type of the sludge we are using during the startup. It is uh, as it is so called that if it is the granules is it is the sludge is granular in nature, so performance of the reactor is very good compared to the flocculating in nature. Uh, as compared to the normal wastewater, not kind of the complex wastewater. So what is the myth about this? Whether it is true or uh, it is only myth? 
what uh, that uh, for startup during the startup of this usb reactor for granular sludge is very much important for its performance it depends. It, it depends. depends on the type of wastewater you are using. Yeah. If you are using, a, um, a <coughs> sorry, if you are using a highly soluble wastewater, then the granules will maintain, will keep. Yeah. But if you are using, for example, more acidified wastewater or uh, complex wastewater with the high contents of proteins and high contents of fats, then you will uh, lose your granules. Then okay, the so if you want to buy granules, as I said, they are expensive, but if you want to buy granules, be sure that they are to uh, use with the um, highly soluble wastewater, like from a beer factory, beverage in general. So then it is better to switch from granules to uh, flocculating sludge for startup, startup of the reactor. Yes, it may take some time, but it works exactly uh, the same way as as the granular sludge. Can you just briefly mention that what uh, what is the range of the startup period when you shifting from granule to flocculating sludge for during the startup period? Is it significantly reduce the startup period, or it takes little bit little bit uh, longer time? To start up with flocculant. Yeah, yeah flocculant. Uh, no, uh, I think it's the same, more or less. The same period, more or less same. Yes, yes. More or less same. And one more thing that biogas generation for both intermittent and continuous are same or little bit it will improve? The, the, biogas, the biogas production with the intermittent is about 20 to 25% higher than with the continuous for the same amount of organic matter. So uh, one last question is what, what is the future perspective of that USB reactor? Whether uh, you, is there any new development or is there any new addition in the future it, it will come up? Well, um, there are many developments in the UASB and EGSB reactors, but these developments are proprietary. You know, these are from the companies I showed you, PAC. Yeah and Veolia and so on, and Biotim, Biotain, and um, they are always developing uh, new types of reactors. Uh, but what happens is that uh, if you want to use these reactors, you have to pay, and it's not very... Um, yeah, very expensive. It is very expensive. Yeah. So uh, this is the problem. So if you want to improve um, the, the, the operation of your UASB reactors, uh, it's better maybe to switch to flocculent sludge, to try a bit of intermittent operation and so on, and you will have uh, better results uh, without needing to buy these expensive proprietary uh, designs. Yeah, yeah, I'm fully agree with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bye. Dr. Par thank you, Partha, for this uh, comments. Uh, Dr. Rashish, please. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Nidish. And thank you, Maria, for very nice presentation. It was very extensive and very, uh, it is like starting new things like intermittent uh, loading. So uh, I, I have only one question. And that is, <coughs> so uh, as you told, you have run your reactor in two type of operation mode intermittent mode and then continuous mode and in intermittent mode you have double the organic loading i have what sorry you have in intermittent mode you have doubled organic loads Lo load yes. loading is high yes. and then later on you concluded that the microbiology of both the sludge is different so here is my question when we operate a reactor with different kind of loads means different loads then definitely microbiology is changed it will be changed and so it is in, in in i don't know whether i'm correct or not it is not because of intermittent load uh, operation but because of difference in organic load the microbiology is changing because of difference of organic load so in shorter period, if you are loading your reactor with 
some higher load then microbiology will be different and in 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 longer period if you are dividing your load in longer period then microbiology will be different so it is not like i i don't know whether i am correct or not but in intermittent you and the the, the continuous because of this microbiology is changed and we 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 should somewhere include this this consideration also uh, Yes. I, uh, because, like, I, I, in, in short, like, I can say that, like, the, it is not be, the change microbiology is not because of intermittent, uh, intermittent and continuous feeding, but because of difference in load. Uh, maybe it is the difference in load, but the fact is that uh, in the intermittent reactor we find uh, the the key microbial groups that are. Um, that are uh, important for the degradation of fats and oils. Uh, and this microbial group disappeared from the continuous reactor. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and, it was, and it was present in the initial sludge. So I think it is more related to the hydraulic retention time. No. Because the initial, the initial inoculum uh, was from a reactor that was operated with the um, hydraulic retention time of six days, six and a half days. Yeah. And then we put this inoculum in a continuous reactor with a 12 hours hydraulic retention time. And then this key microbial group, the Cintrophomonas, disappeared. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. washed out from the reactor. Yeah, yeah. But it was maintained in the um, intermittent reactor. I think this is more related to the mode of operation than uh, to the organic loading rate. In, in, in literature, common literature, like you, you will find a lot of support, like if your load is different, even if you are loading with same substrate, similar kind of substrate, and if you are loading it, in, uh, if you are loading at a different uh, amount, then the microbiology is suddenly changing, and maybe that that may be the reason of disappearing or appearing some of the uh, key key my, microbial community. Like you are in case of uh, it, it uh, like when you were uh, you were running your reactor in intermittent mode, then the fat oxidizing material uh, micro, uh, microbes are appearing, and archaea is also enhanced. Yes, I think so. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ashish. Thank yeah, you for thanks. this uh, wonderful uh, comment. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Browser Maria Nadez for this wonderful talk, excellent talk. She covered uh, the basics of uh, UASB reactor along with the different types of operations. It, uh, how it will affect, what, what the microbiology, microbiology, how it will change with the uh, the operations, how we can uh, achieve the, around the complete COD removal. Thank you, madam, for this wonderful talk. Thank you. And I think uh, most of the people will be enlightened with uh, this talk. And I also thank all the uh, speakers in, uh, from NATs, from CSIR labs, for uh, 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 writing with Dr. Nadez for, and make the program very wonderful. And as you know, today is the last day of uh, the webinar session. So after the 10th, 10th day program, that is on uh, last Friday, we floated the feedback form to all the participants who weren't registered for the program. We received 2,200 uh, feedbacks. That means 2,200 people were given the feedbacks. Overall rating, we received around 70% uh, were agreeing excellent program and 28% uh, were agreeing very good program and remaining a few are agreeing that it is a good program, overall rating. So this is because, mainly because of uh, the speakers, especially from the all the parts of the world, USA, Australia, and uh, Mexico, Greece. So many people were came and they given their uh, their views. They are given in different topics. Apart from that, we had uh, a vast number of uh, experts. 
around 35 to 40 experts were there in all the total in total were there in for all the programs they are given their views and uh, make the uh, discussion in a different levels i thank all the experts who have joined with me for this program apart from that we the viewers is is quite high i say mentioned we have more than 4500 viewers for the initial first initial day talk and it is average we are getting more than 1500 viewers per day i have i also thank all the viewers for watching the program and from the feedback we came to know that the viewers needs more talk in the or more lectures in this series definitely we will consider all these uh, talk uh, consider all the topics what we what the viewers mentioned so the support from our director is also quite high because from the starting this was started very recently within a day he supported he told that we, we should start this type of program so from uh, direct uh, from the support from director is the very immense and he supported like anything thank you uh, director for supporting the program and uh dr ashish ashish you can see that ashish is also is a part of this program he's he supported me a lot oh, a lot thank you ashish for supporting me supporting me for this program but if you are seeing that screen it is not operated by the ashish it is operated by my students the entire program was controlled by students uh, vaishak sham ranjit safar and they are control the entire program 11th day program all the sub between we faced some problems they are rectified without my help they rectified all the pro uh, problems thank you my students and a few groups are near to my cabin they are also working for this program because the questions raised by students will be collected uh, by the students uh, my my own students they are working for that one and they will uh, that uh, collections will be converted to the respective speakers so ashita jemi aburwan bibu is working for that part thank you for all for joining this program and i think we will come with another uh, series with similar kind of experts will be will see you soon thank you for watching this program thank you thank you all thank you very much congratulations nidish for successful completion of the program thank you sir so thank you for inviting as a panel member so really i enjoyed uh, the lecture today thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you very much thank you dr nidesh thank you dr yadav yeah thank you sir <laughs> good to see you again yeah sure <laughs> okay yeah we will meet again okay okay, okay. 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 okay dr nidesh dr reddy thank you bye 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 thank you bye 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 bye